unite. Chechnya's gay purge, the big impact of small donations, and the card game that ranks blackness. Even me playing it, sometimes I'm like, damn, why do I think that? Like, that's fucked up. Otto Warmbier, the U.S. student released by North Korea last week, has died. Warmbier was in a coma, and doctors said he had a severe brain injury, which occurred at some point during his detention. In a statement, his family said, quote, the awful torturous mistreatment our son received at the hands of the North Koreans ensured that no other outcome was possible beyond the sad one we experience today. Two separate attacks in two European cities are being investigated as terrorist acts. In Paris, an armed man intentionally rammed his car, filled with explosives, into a police van. The suspect died and no one else was injured. In London, a van plowed into a crowd leaving a mosque after Ramadan prayers. At least one person is dead and ten were injured. Witnesses say the driver was shouting, I want to kill all Muslims, before people pinned him to the ground. The number of people dead or missing and presumed dead from last week's fire at a public housing tower in London has risen to 79. Only five have been formally identified. The investigation into the disaster is ongoing, but there have been allegations that a recent renovation didn't include necessary fire safety. For something to spread this quickly um, and this dangerously, something's gone seriously wrong. The contractor for the renovation said they'd met all required standards. Russia says it'll treat U.S. warplanes operating in parts of Syria as potential targets after an American fighter jet shot down a Syrian warplane on Sunday, the first time the U.S. has done that since 2011. Russia called the attack, quote, military aggression and has suspended a military channel of communication used to avoid collisions in Syrian airspace. White House advisor and President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, made his first public address since joining the administration. He spoke at a technology summit of business leaders, including Apple CEO Tim Cook. Our goal here is simple. We are here to improve the day-to-day -day lives of the average citizen. That's a core promise, and we are keeping it. Together, we will unleash the creativity of the private sector to provide citizen services in a way that has never happened before. In Chechnya, dozens of gay men have been detained, beaten, and tortured in a purge of the republic's LGBT population, according to human rights groups. Chechnya is a conservative Islamic country, and being gay is considered a scandal that brings shame on entire families. In fact, Chechen authorities deny that there are any gay people there at all. And if there are no gay people there, they say, there couldn't possibly have been a crackdown. And Hassan traveled to Chechnya to see the evidence. Ayub Kataev runs the Ministry for Internal Affairs in the Chechen town of Argun. He's the warden of the town's prison. Kataev and his subordinates allegedly took part in torturing more than 100 gay men as part of a crackdown ordered by high-level officials. Victims claim they were locked up and attacked in the abandoned Argon police facility and other locations in Chechnya. As soon as we arrived in Argon, we were met by police officers and were currently being escorted by around six cars who were taking us to one of the locations where it's alleged the victims were held. As far as we're aware, we're the first foreign journalists that have been taken here. Комната отдыха, там э, склады у меня, все, вот это пустующее здание, которое они говорят, якобы я да, людей пытал, да, так и так. Ну, можно проверить полностью, да. Вы видите, одна пыль, вот даже следов нету. Yeah, there are footprints everywhere. There are people that have been walking around here. 
and there are rooms everywhere that people could be taken into. Dažas lida neto gde būtų ryšiotki stojali o oknach. Dažas dvėrė, hatė bus lėt pokazai to. Postroili galubuk ir būdim mai čečenzi, būdim s nimi apšiats apšie. Jemu vot lubomu maimu satrūniku būdut padla prosto detronuta da eto čelovieka, dažas jis on jis. Ne to, što jeho izbivajat ili pitajat. Chechnya is part of the Russian Federation, which means it's supposed to adhere to Russian law. But in reality, Chechnya's president, Ramzan Kadyrov, has the freedom to run his republic the way he wants, in return for pledging his loyalty to Vladimir Putin. Well, it's pretty clear that you were able to visit uh, the facility in Orgun uh, based on an agreement with very high-level local police officials. Tanya Lakshina is the Russian director at Human Rights Watch and an expert on Chechnya. It's a facility which was described to us and to others in great detail by numerous former detainees and their allegations are very weighty and very credible. We were also told that there have been investigators uh, from Moscow who've visited the site. Yes. Can you tell us at what stage that investigation's at and what they're expecting to get from it? This is actually the first time in many years that the Kremlin pledged an investigation into those egregious violations in Chechnya. And that only happened, in my opinion, as a result of strong, consolidated international pressure. I feel optimistic. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, we've seen Ramzan Kadyrov getting away with such abuses for over a decade now. What we can see, on the other hand, is that we are not getting new reports about detentions of gay people in Chechnya. So it seems like the Kremlin made Kadyrov stop. I mean, the reality is that there is nobody here now, but what the human rights organizations would say is they've been removed, they've been taken away from this place, of course, as soon as uh, it gains international attention. Is there anything that you can use to prove that this didn't happen? What I want to show you is that I am open with you. I don't want to hide you. Let me tell you that they were here. Тим боле, де как тут могут содружаться люди, да там живут гражданские люди, если незаконно я содержу даже. But it may not be a matter of imagination. Vice News spoke to one of the alleged victims who viewed our footage and said categorically that he recognized both the prison buildings and Ayub Kataev. The victim told us he was electrocuted inside the complex. He added that he was 200% certain that he remembers being brought to his knees and beaten by Kataev. You've been personally named as one of the police officers who had taken part in the torture. How do you respond to this? Well, I don't know why they say that. Maybe they want to change or we don't think that they are among us. Are you saying that the human rights organizations are lying? Are you saying that these victims are lying? And why would they do that? And then, maybe someone да хочет там заработать статус беженца, там выехать бесплатно, получить гражданство. Если Химович сразу говорит, что и она врет, тот человек, который якобы здесь был, он тоже врет. But there's a precedent for this kind of allegation. The Kadyrov regime has been accused of brutally suppressing dissidents through forced disappearances and extrajudicial killings. Kadyrov has cultivated an image as a strong man. His social media posts show him working out and practicing mixed martial arts. His government has a human rights council, which officially deals with these complaints. Khada Saratova is the head. Это заявление людей, которые к нам обращаются. Я не говорю, что в Чечне нет проблем. Why would anybody who's gay go to somebody who works for the government because there's a risk to their life? Во-первых, если я не увидела ни одного гея перед собой и не принес мне ни одного заявления, даже устного, я не могу признать, что они есть. Это во-первых. Во-вторых, если они есть, конечно, я им буду помогать, если они придут. 
Но э, сегодня, если он является членом вот этого ЛГБТ-сообщества, этот человек, зная наши традиции, обычаи, мог просто пойти на вокзал, купить билет и уехать, не афишировать это все. We met several Chechen gay men who had fled to Moscow after they feared their lives were at risk, sometimes from their own family members. They asked for their identities to be concealed to protect their safety. То есть, когда началась эта вспышка по отлову геев, изначально меня забрал мой дядя родной, он начал бить, то есть это элементарные пощечины, там подзатыльники, прикладство, то есть бил и ногами, избивал, даже побрил меня. Many of the victims we met told us they still don't feel safe, even after leaving Chechnya. Can you tell me what it's like to be a gay man in Chechnya? Из древней как-то в Чечне как-то позор смывается как бы только кровью. И, конечно, если ты уже будешь говорить, что ты гей открыто, это уже можно сказать самоубийство. What's it been like having to leave your family and your friends and your life behind. I don't know. For me, the family is everything. I don't understand if they will lose their family. It's just that they will lose their family. Just leave them and leave them. Just leave them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Я тоже месяц, и просто за это время не чувствую себя безопасным здесь, потому что в том плане, что в любой момент со мной могут приехать, могут догадаться, где я, узнать, увезти, и все, и где-то мертвым покажусь, и все. Brexit negotiations finally began today, almost a full year after the UK voted to quit the European Union. It's the start of a two-year process, and with the British government suddenly in total disarray, it'll be anything but easy. The UK's Brexit Secretary David Davis met the EU's chief negotiator Michel Barnier in Brussels today to kick off a two-year relationship that will basically be one long breakup. There's more that unites us than that divides us. So while we'll undoubtedly be challenging times ahead of us in the negotiations, we will do all that we can to assure that we deliver a deal that works in the best interests of all citizens. But today's five hours of talks were mainly about arranging more talks, and the two sides have a lot to sort out if they're to come up with a deal before March 2019, when Britain is formally supposed to leave the EU. Prime Minister Theresa May's poor performance in the general election has weakened the UK's hand. It's not certain how long she'll remain in charge, and it's suddenly much less clear what Britain actually wants. Lord Gus O'Donnell ran the UK's civil service for six years. In Europe, you know, we have to remember, this is not number one on their list of really important things. And then comes Brexit, which is an irritant. They'd like it to go away. They will be disappointed. They will want to get on with it. And they'll want us to kind of make up our minds. What are we asking for? Because they've been very clear about what they're offering. For its part, the EU is very clear about its priorities. It wants to protect the rights of European citizens living in the UK, as well as keeping the Irish border open, and it also wants a so-called divorce settlement of up to $111 billion to cover the UK's obligations to pensions and spending plans it already signed up for. More fundamentally, it wants a deal that makes leaving the EU look like a very bad idea, and that's something that almost all of Europe agrees on. John Ossoff, the 30-year-old Democratic contender in tomorrow's special congressional race in Georgia's 6th district, has already made history. His campaign has raised more than $23 million, five times as much as his Republican opponent, Karen Handel, and more than any congressional candidate ever. 
But what's really important about Ossoff's fundraising haul isn't how much he's raised, it's how he raised it. While plenty of big spenders have given to Ossoff, he's raised most of his money via small donations, much like Bernie Sanders did in 2016. At the end of March, almost 200,000 individual donors had already given to the campaign, most of them through the crowdfunding site Act Blue, and the average donation was less than $50. That trend continued over the last two months. Nearly two-thirds of the money Ossoff raised in April and May came from people who gave less than $200. And even though most house races are often funded by local money, most of Ossoff's contributors don't even live in his state. That intense and broad financial support is unheard of in off-year special elections, which usually slip by unnoticed. But in this case, it's exactly what's driving Ossoff's success. In 2018, there will be 435 Democrats running for House seats and vying for donations from the anti-Trump base. Right now, there's only one. Conservative groups are trying to counter the flood of progressive money in the Georgia race with last-minute TV ads. One of them uses last week's attack on the Republican congressional baseball team to drive turnout. Now the unhinged left is endorsing and applauding shooting Republicans. When will it stop? It won't if John Ossoff wins on Tuesday. The idea of an armed left-wing movement on the march is, like most political attacks, a convenient exaggeration. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to it. Brian Levin realized the size of the problem last year when he went as an observer to a KKK rally in Anaheim and found himself caught up in a mob of furious counter-protesters. The Grand Dragon fell and was immediately set upon by a mob. Get away! Get away! And that was like the longest four minutes of my life. And at that point, I saw something coalescing on the hard left. Levin's a former New York police officer and an expert in homegrown extremism at Cal State San Bernardino. He frequently briefs lawmakers and law enforcement officials on emerging trends in American extremist movements. For much of the past decade, that's meant focusing largely on the far right, anti-government militias and patriot movements that range from survivalists who bury ammunition in the woods to so-called sovereign citizens who've killed police officers. According to the Anti-Defamation League, far-right extremism has accounted for nearly three-quarters of all extremism-related murders since 2007. By comparison, Islamic extremists were responsible for just 24%. But lately, experts like Levin have begun seeing stirrings of a similar form of violent radicalism on the other end of the ideological spectrum. And it's not just one-off events like counter-protests by Antifa, which made news recently for brawling with the alt-right in Berkeley, California. Now we're seeing organizing by groups, not just to respond to, oh, there's a Make America Great rally, or there's the Klan marching, but to something even more nefarious, and that is we need resistance to include violence as a preferred response. And we're not just gonna do it at an event. We're going to do it as a staple of our strategy, as a tactic. And that's really worrisome. Violence from the far left is not new. In the 1960s and 70s, groups like the Black Panthers and the Weather Underground sometimes deployed terror-like tactics to advance left-wing ambitions. By comparison, today's movements remain small, responsible for at most 2% of all extremism-related deaths in the ADL's count. But experts like Levin say there seems to be something new happening, a sense that far-right movements aren't going away at a time when some far-left groups are beginning to adopt their methods and mindset. What I worry about is frayed edges of this unraveling magic carpet of democracy that is encouraging this kind of continuing orchestrated dance of conflict and demonization that then unravels us even more. The Supreme Court issued a major decision today, ruling that an Asian rock band called The Slants can trademark their controversial name, despite a federal law banning disparaging trademarks. The court decided that law, the Lanham Act, violates the First Amendment's free speech clause. 
the ruling could mean that the NFL's Washington Redskins, whose trademark was canceled under the same provision, will have their controversial logo reinstated. Trading races is a new party game where players argue about what it means to be black in America. It's awkward and fun. Dexter Thomas went to Chicago to try it out. There's been an interview out with Keenan and, and everybody else who's been on SNL. Keenan has been holding that show together for years. Does all the work, gets no credit. What is blacker than that? Let me tell you something. Michael Jackson reached the epitome of human existence. People forgot Michael was black. <laughs> After folks forgot he was black, he said he was black. That I'm black. Like that's the craziest shit I ever heard in my life. <laughs> Trading races is a pretty simple game. There's 52 cards in a deck, and each player gets five cards. The deck is made up of all kinds of notable black figures like Nelson Mandela and Maya Angelou, with some conversation starters mixed in, like Justin Bieber and Rachel Dolezal. If you can convince everyone the person on your card is the blackest, you win the hand, win enough hands, and you win the game. Kenyatta Forbes is the creator of the game. How did you come up with the concept for this game? I had a weird uh, graduate art school experience. Um, had a professor tell me as a, a white woman, it was her, she wanted to take me out of my victimhood. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, she put up um, images of lynchings and my whole cohort of uh, colleagues during uh, grad school were all white. And she was like, Kenyatta, how does this make you feel? So experiences like that. Okay. Kind of started the uh, fueling the energy to, to figure out how to have a conversation around race. There's no set definition for blackness, so players have to come up with that criteria for themselves. Forbes hopes that process will help people come to terms with their own racial biases. You were talking about how Michael Jordan changed the game. Yeah. Dennis Rodman, I think, changed the game in a more cultural way. The dude showed up in a dress. As humans, we are kind of trained to put things into categories. Mm -hmm. And that's how we build our understandings. It's a game that, I mean, even, even me playing it, sometimes I'm like, damn, why do I think that? Like, that's fucked up. In the game, you're literally pitting black people against each other. Is that a bad thing? You know, there's always a pro and con to every situation. So potentially, it has the opportunity to highlight black joy and black positivity. You could be arguing the best parts about what somebody has contributed. The game also comes with wild cards. So players can add someone who isn't already featured in the deck. Matt Turner, revolutionary, uprising, led a, like a revolt. I mean, what's blacker than that? But his legacy, how has it survived? Whereas Maya Angelou has inspired, not just indirectly, but directly, every single black person that we look up to today. Can white people play this game? I've played it with engineers and developers who are predominantly white in a, you know, in a predominantly white space. So I've seen all cultures, um, races play this with no issue. Really, is that, it's not uncomfortable at all? It's supposed to be uncomfortable though. Clarence Thomas has been around for, for fucking ever. And he's actually helped lead the civil rights movement, just like with with what he's done like through television and everything of that sense. Like it's I think we're on first right now. Yep. <laughs> Winning a round of trading races doesn't leave you with the same sense of joy you get from playing most card games. In fact, it can be a little bittersweet. First of all, I don't think anybody technically wins until society gets to a point where they're not putting people in a box as to what it means to be black, then nobody will ever win. Well, speaking of people who are making differences right now, Frederick, Frederick Douglass, Douglas, he's doing some great things. Doing like great things. Yesterday. <laughs> as a thinker, he's amazing. As a writer, he's amazing. All right, let me go back to Maya real quick. Okay. <laughs> Maya was accepted across races, across that is genders, true. That is true. without Just compromising intersection. who she yeah. was as yeah. a black woman. Yeah. She was unapologetically black. I can tell you on a debate team. <laughs> I was never on a debate team, <laughs> but I'm married, so I'll argue all the day. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
That's Vice News Tonight for Monday, June 19th.